Thank you. I'm, I'm actually really happy to be here and sort of amazed that this is my first visit to IPGP, so it's about time, right? Um, in, in thinking about what to present on, um, I do work on a whole range of volcanology topics, but I decided that this was a good opportunity to pull together some work on volcanic ash. And um, I told the students a story, and that is that I moved to Bristol in 2011 uh, with money from the AXA Insurance Company, from their research fund. And this was motivated by Steve Sparks and John Blundy getting in touch with me and asking me to apply. And in March of 2010, I was in Bristol with them trying to brainstorm about how to write a proposal. Because at that point, AXA had only funded people in France and in the fields of health and economics. So that was March of 2010. The proposal was due in May of 2010. And in April of 2010, it became very clear how I should frame the proposal. So I told the AXA I'd work on volcanic ash, and since that time, that has been one strand of research. Um, I had already been thinking about the relationships between magma ascent, crystallization, bubble formation, and fragmentation, so it was a natural step to look at uh, volcanic ash and see how we could use it to look at eruption dynamics. Uh, clearly, there are syneruptive ash hazards. And since that time, I've learned there's a, a whole world out there who look at cryptotephra. This is very small amounts of tephra shards uh, that are all often used just as an isochron for paleoclimate studies, uh, but we're trying to use in volcanology. And I've also become um, fairly passionate about thinking not only about primary volcanic impacts, but also recognizing that after a very large eruption, or even not so large eruption, uh, you have to, uh, when the ash lands on the land, <coughs> you have to deal with it for, for um, maybe years, maybe decades, maybe even centuries after. And I may or may not get to this part of the talk, but I did want to point out this is uh, in Alaska. It's the deposit from an eruption of Katmai in 1912. And this was an ash remobilization event in 2003 that closed the Anchorage airport, so 100 years later. So uh, what I will try to cover, I'll talk a little bit about ash formation. As I said, this is what I was uh, thinking about initially when I arrived at Bristol in 2011. Um, I'll then talk a little about the physical properties of ash and some then about how those physical properties affect ash transport. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll talk about problems of ash remobilization. So basically, um, in a very broad sense, the, the way in which magmas ascend and erupt is going to control the physical properties of the ash that forms because of those processes, or the, the ash and other tephra class. Um, we have two sort of end member models of how eruptions, uh, explosive eruptions can happen. One is what I think of as a bottom up model where the magma is rising, bubbles grow, expand, interact, and ultimately fragment to form ash particles. Um, another is sort of a top down process where you have some disturbance of the volcano itself, such as the uh, landslide that initiated the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and then you have a pressure, a decompression wave that goes down and uh, can disrupt or fragment material from the top down. Um, in this bottom-up process, again, there are sort of two end members. If we have low viscosity magmas, then we think of fragmentation formed by uh, some sort of instability in the liquid phase, just like Hawaiian fire fountains. Um, in much more viscous silicic magmas, then it appears that a lot of the fragmentation is instead by brittle processes. And we can see this in the eruptive process, or in the products. Uh, this are, these are typical uh, pyroclasts or tephroclasts from a Hawaiian type fountain. They're very fluidal in form. They're pretty large. Uh, and, in fact, there's a, a distinct absence of the very small particles that travel long distances, which we call volcanic ash. 
In silica corruptions, in contrast, uh, the, the pyroclasts are much smaller. There's abundant fine ash. And you can see they're very um, platy and sort of broken shapes. And there's also a distinct difference in the grain size, as I alluded to it. Again, I've picked N members here. Um, and this, I apologize, is on a, a fee scale, which is sedimentology scale, so that you're getting smaller in this direction. So I've put a, an actual scale up here. But you can see, as an example, Mount St. Helens, which was rather unusual. I'll talk about this more later. But it's dominated by very small particles. Um, so the mode is somewhere on the order of, of 20 or 30 microns, whereas something like Hawaiian at the other end of the spectrum is dominated by very large clasts. <coughs> now, the, the liquid instability end of things is something that I would say we don't have good models for. Um, these pictures were inspired by a website that my close collaborator, uh, Alison Russ, stumbled across. And it's a woman who's an artist. And <laughs> she throws liquids in the air and photographs them with her iPhone. And we thought, what a great thing to do with students. So we went across the street to the local park and started experimenting with just tossing liquids up in the air and photographing them with our iPhones. And what's interesting is that you can see that the fluids with different properties have very different trajectories when given the same um, non-calibrated toss. And you can see, interestingly, we, we played quite a bit with uh, whipped cream, which is the only one of these fluids that has bubbles in it. And you can see that is actually breaking apart. Um, whereas the liquid instabilities here are uh, determined, presumably, by their rheology. So if anyone wants a project, I think this is a very understudied topic. Uh, we know a little bit more, we have a little bit more theory, at least, for fragmentation when you have bubbles that are expanding and interacting. And this is something that Allison and I have thought about, uh, where you have um, competition between the overpressure in the bubbles and the ability to release that overpressure by gas escaping through permeable networks. And we can write equations for that for both a viscous term but also an inertial term because uh, gases are probably quite high Reynolds number. And the important scaling parameters are the length scale the overpressure, which is driving gas flow, and the permeability. And here, uh, we just did a simple scaling using measured permeabilities, both viscous and inertial. And the simple story makes sense. If you have low decompression rates and small degassing lengths, then the gas can escape. If you have very rapid decompression, or long length scales, then you're going to overpressure and form ash. And we were thinking about this initially because uh, the models, the really simple models of just fragmenting by bubble-bubble interaction did not explain, they explained volcanic ash, which are the interstices between the bubbles, but they didn't explain why we got a whole range of class sizes, including pumice. Uh, we also could test this with my favorite volcano, because it's the one I started on, but I keep returning to because we know so much about it. So for Mount St. Helens, we knew from work by Carrie and Sigurdsson um, in particular, the, and then also later, uh, Bill Rose and Adam Durant, the total grain size distribution that was created by the eruption, or an estimate of it. And those are these two symbols. And then uh, my student and my first student, Caroline Klug, had worked on bubble size distributions in the, the class. And a power law plot of the number greater than, so it's a cumulative number, versus the size of either the bubble or the grain size um, give you the same slope 
and they, they overlie on top of each other. So this suggests that at least in the Mount St. Helens magma, the grain size is closely related or controlled by the bubble size distribution. And I will come back to this later as well. Of course, that's uh, the initial permeability model is, is quite simple. Um, and since then, uh, Amanda Lindu, working with Jess Larson, and then me remotely in Alaska, has run decompression experiments and developed a small permeameter where she could measure the permeability of the experimental samples. And has played with not only different decompression rates, but also different amounts of small particles or crystals in the, the melt. So her experiments confirm what a number of Japanese studies have showed, that if you just have a viscous liquid and you decompress it and start to form bubbles, you don't, the bubbles don't connect up and become permeable until uh, very high vesicularities so up to about 70%. And this is well beyond what you would predict theoretically for just touching bubbles, which should connect up at about 30%. But of course, to form a permeable network, you not only have to have them interact, but then you have to thin and break the viscous melt layer between them. So it seems like uh, you need to get to very high vesicularities. And this is consistent with what we see in sort of crystal poor pumice is typically has vesicularities of 70% or more. Um, in contrast, if we add particles uh, or crystals, then what we see is when we get to about 20% uh, crystals, then the vesicularity at which you start to develop permeability drops. And you can see that these are just thin section images where the, the black is matrix. It's melt plus crystals. The white are bubbles. This is for a fairly low crystallinity <coughs> sample. And as you increase the crystallinity, you can see that the, the bubble networks get more and more elongated um, by the crystals. And this is also consistent with some work that a student did with uh, me and Allison, looking at analog materials, where again we saw that when you got to close to the point where the crystals were forming connected frameworks, then you started seeing actually quite efficient gas escape along what she started calling pseudo fractures, that were aligned fractures. Okay, so that was a, a little introduction to basic. Uh, fragmentation theory. And I wanted to spend a little time now looking at what is volcanic ash. And ash, from a volcanological definition, is just a grain size. So it's anything smaller than two millimeters. Um, it clearly is a misnomer in some ways. It's a very old term, so cenere in Italian. Uh, and it was thought to be analogous or look like ash formed by burning wood. Okay, of course, it has nothing to do with that. It's just a grain size. And um, volcanic ash can include a number of different components. So what I was talking about in the theory uh, would generate ash that is just the interstices between bubbles, so what we call glass shards. Uh, we also have ash that is microvesicular, but in addition, we have lots of other uh, material in volcanic ash. We have some that are is microcrystalline. We have pieces of crystals themselves, or whole crystals. And we also have what we lump together as just lithic fragments, which are parts typically of the, the old volcanic edifice or the conduit that have gotten uh, broken and mixed up in the eruption. And Realize that, that a lot of these, the primary characteristics, so forget about the lithics, are controlled by the, the way that the magma uh, gets to the surface. And uh, this is a, obviously a very simplified magma chamber, but we know we have uh, crystallization going on at depth, and that will produce fairly large crystals, uh, commonly 
sort of 100 to 500 microns, sometimes larger than that. And then as the magma ascends, if it's water rich, which most arc magmas are, then as the water comes out, it changes the stability of the crystal phases. And so you start to get crystals that can form as the magma ascends. This is clearly a quite com creates quite complex feedbacks between ascent, rheology, bubble growth, et cetera. Um, and what we see just looking at samples in the field is that when we have a good plenty interruption with really rapid ascent rates, then the particles are mostly volcanic glass, shown here in gray, with bubbles, which are shown in black. If the exact same magma ascends more slowly, then you get a number of crystals, which are all these uh, rectangular shapes in a glass, which is the intermediate gray, um, and with some bubbles. The rate or the, the efficiency of crystallization during ascent will change with composition. And so in more mafic melts that are lower viscosities, then crystals can grow quite rapidly. And in fact, it's, it's rare, if not um, totally, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a, a really nice um, vesicular pyroclast from a hydrous mafic melt, because they just crystallize too quickly when they're going up. And so here you can see that there's a melt phase. You've got a lot of these dark uh, rectangular shapes, which are little plagioclase crystals. And the consequence is that you have um, thicker bubble walls than you did when you just had the pure melt, and typically lower vesicularities. So this was a so-called plenty interruption of Colima in Mexico. And we can see that uh, this is a compilation that Allison Rust and I did a couple of years ago for an overview paper on volcanic ash. And what we have plotted here is this is the bulk magma composition versus the glass composition. So down here, you have no crystals at all. So if uh, you have no crystals, then the bulk composition and the glass composition are the same. And you can see there's a very interesting pattern here. And this was, it was basically you know, all the data we could find easily for various eruption sizes and various compositions. And um, what you see is here in the, the so dacite to rhyolite end is that for a range of bulk magmas, you have the same matrix glass composition. And for those of you who are petrologists, you'll recognize that this is, this is basically a eutectic composition so that it crystallizes and then gets stuck at that composition. Um, in the more mafic magmas, so we're andesite to basaltic andesite, then we see a huge range, and the lines are connecting samples from the same eruption. So we get a range not only between eruptions, but within eruptions. And we can uh, see that basically as this range are our, uh, the mafic very rapid syneruptive crystallization. And then this is the larger eruptions. Um, and this crystallization is probably pre-erupted. This has phenocrysts that have pushed the glass composition up to uh, the eutectic, but they're not crystallizing microlites. And we have this interesting gap here, <laughs> which is sort of a, a seems to be a no-go zone, at least for calc-alkaline magmas. Um, we can start to fill it with when we get into the more alkaline material. Um, the ash particles, as I alluded to earlier, can also vary in shape and vesicularity. And my former student, Emma Liu, did a lot of work on figuring out how we best characterize both the internal and the external textures of these samples. And so this, 
gives us, hopefully, the, the background to look at some applications of, so why is componentry important? And I wanted to show you one example uh, that was work done by Julia Eshen um, when she was a postdoc with us. And I set her the question of, you know, let's see what we can figure out about what actually happened at Mount St. Helens on May 18th. So for those of you not as familiar with Mount St. Helens as some of us, um, there was about two months of precursory activity, very strong seismicity, so numerous magnitude five earthquakes, which is fairly unusual for volcanoes. And uh, accompanying that was movement of the volcanic edifice to the north by about 50 meters. So this was not subtle. We didn't have INSAR, but you didn't need it. So uh, the, the thought is that magma was intruding up into the edifice. It couldn't quite get out the top, and so it was pushing the north flank. And then uh, at 8.32 AM on May 18th, there was a simultaneous magnitude 5.1 earthquake and sudden collapse of the north flank. There's a debate back and forth whether the earthquake caused the collapse or whether the collapse was the earthquake. But anyway, they happened at the same time. And you had, uh, here's the collapse, and then you had a lateral blast, actually three successive lateral blasts that went, were directed to the north. And then um, there was, so there was activity, but relatively low-level activity for about three hours. And then by the middle of the day, you developed a very strong plenian column that lasted until late in the afternoon. So you had two very separate events. And I had done a lot of work on the, what we call the cryptodome, the magma that was intruding in the edifice. And I knew that it had lots and lots of tiny crystals that we should be able to see. Um, and another problem here, or what people thought was a problem, was just uh, some aspects of the deposit. So these, this is an ISO mass map that just shows contours of mass of the deposit. It was very well characterized because uh, people got out in the field right away. And one thing that was noticed that has received a lot of attention was this Secondary mass maximum, um, probably related to aggregation of small ash particles. What has received less attention is that there's a real asymmetry to the deposit. Um, so here's the volcano, and you can see that most of the deposit is to the north. And in fact, there was a, a paper in 2010 trying to model this deposit, and they just had a sentence in the paper that said, well, in order to fit the deposit, we had to move the volcano 50 kilometers to the north. And I'm like, well, the one thing that we know is where the volcano is. <laughs> OK, so that's received less attention. Um, as I said, we, could, we know what the cryptodome looked like. We know what the Plinian, ash from the Plinian deposit looked like. We also know that the blast included a lot of just junk from the, the mountain as it was collapsing. And so Julia did quite a bit of work. And uh, we had good samples in transects across the plume. And she was able to uh, determine the proportion at each site of material from the Plinian column and material from the blast. And basically, what she saw is that this odd northern asymmetry was caused by the blast, which actually traveled about 30 kilometers to the north before it rose up and became a big column. So there's a, there's a good explanation uh, for that asymmetry. And then the wind direction was strongly to the east. So we, could, we can separate the co-PDC, or the, the blast co-blast plume, from the Plinian plume. And we see that also in a fairly unusual asymmetry in grain size across the deposit. So these two transects are here and here. And if you look across them, you can see that in the south, the grain size is quite bimodal. Again, this is a phi scale. So these are dominated by coarse 
pumice class, and this is ash, whereas up here we see just fine ash. So we can explain both the asymmetry of the deposit and the asymmetry of the grain size distributions by recognizing that they're two very different sources and that the blast was generating a lot of very fine grain material relative to the plinian. Okay, one more example of components, and then we'll move on to ash transport. Uh, but this is work by my former student, Emma Liu, and we looked at two eruptions in Iceland. So the Eyjafjallajökull eruption is the one that everyone remembers from 2010, but there was another eruption in 2011 that also temporarily uh, caused a halt in air traffic or the temporary closure of airspace and <clears throat> made people realize that uh, actually Iceland was a much bigger ash hazard than maybe we'd recognized, although we should have. Uh, a friend of mine, Sigi Gieselson, is interested in how uh, ash is interacting with the plume chemistry early on. So he rushed out, um, talked his way past the, the gates, and was able to collect samples uh, within the first 24 hours along, this is uh, the main highway around southern Iceland, so along, around Highway 10. And he shared those samples with us, and I'm going to show you data from this sample and this sample. So this is about 50 kilometers from the vent. This is over 100 kilometers from the vent, but along the wind direction or along the axis. First of all, the samples have, are quite variable in shape, and, and I should have said this is a, was an eruption from beneath a glacier, so we know it was interacting with the glacier. Uh, we also know it's basaltic and had very low water content, so you don't have all that sinuscent vesiculation or, and crystal, I mean, sorry, crystallization complication. Um, you can see that there are a range of particles, so these have a, a ductile form, but then a broken shape, so there's some amount of fluidal fragmentation. Um, others have a lot of bubbles in them, but quite thick bubble walls. And others are broken glass plates with what are called in material science riverline fractures, so they're, they're mode one, mode three fractures, so it's propagating and twisting. Uh, and they're, they're quite characteristic of this deposit. For simplicity, we just lumped them into vesicular and non-vesicular, or uh, blocky. And this shows uh, the medial sample is that one, which is about 50 kilometers. The distal sample is that one, which is about 115 kilometers. And this shows the relative proportion of blocky and bubbly grains as a function of grain size. So you can see in the, the, the largest grain size class where you have lots of bubbly grains, then there is some density sorting with distance so that the distal deposit has distinctly more bubbly grains than the medial deposit, and that makes sense. It's, it's lighter, so it's going to travel farther. But for the most part, the pattern you see is just a change in component proportion with grain size. And that seems, or our interpretation is, that that is uh, similar to what we saw at Mount St. Helens, which is that the, the bubble size is actually causing the fragmentation. And so when you're smaller than the bubble size, you're getting blocky shards from in between. When you're larger uh, than the bubble side, you're getting the bubbly or vesicular shards. And this, I apologize, it's a complicated plot. If you just focus here, this is um, grain size distribution in the, the light blue symbols from the, those two sites, the 50 kilometer and the 115. We also include an intermediate one. You can see the grain size distribution is the same with distance, which is another bit of a puzzle, but I won't go into that. And that the grain size um, distribution is very similar to our best estimate shown here in the dashed line of the volume 
uh, the vesicle volume distribution. So they're, they're closely aligned, which suggests the bubbles are affecting fragmentation. Now, this is something that people hadn't been considering for controls on magma water interaction. So we thought this was interesting, decided to look at another example, went to this absolutely beautiful tough cone in northern Iceland. It's called Querfjall, which Quer is just a, a, a steamy vent area, so it's the steamy mountain. And <coughs> this was erupted about 2,800 years ago um, as part of uh, an eruption along the northern volcanic zone of Iceland. So here's the northern volcanic zone. That's the area of Kraflo, which had the most recent eruption along this transect in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. And this eruption is interesting because the same magma traveled south on the rift zone and erupted here in a place called Yardbalsholler to produce a typical, very typical scoria cone basaltic lava flow, just totally garden variety. But then it, the magma clearly continued to propagate down the rift, and here it formed that giant tuff ring. And if we look at um, uh, estimates of groundwater flux in this area, shown by these um, pale gray arrows, uh, the larger the arrow, the higher the groundwater flow, you can see the groundwater is funneled right under Querfjall. So we think that in this case, you formed a big tuff ring because the magma intersected the groundwater. Um, <coughs> so we have the same magma, same eruption condition, or same, basically everything's the same except how it got out the top. And uh, first of all, if we look at our best estimate of the grain size distribution for the magmatic, the scoria cone, you can see, as is typical in scoria cones, most of the class are quite large. Um, in contrast, the vesicle sizes are relatively small. So there's a big difference between the vesicle size and the class size. And this seems typical of our liquid instability. You know, that's the, the liquid tossing way of breaking magma. Um, in contrast, just as we saw at Grimsvoten, at Querfelt, the vesicle size distribution shown in, the, um, in these dots and the grain size distribution are very similar. So it seems like the same story. So we uh, then looked at the components. And in the, the magmatic portion, then most of the components are bubbly. That's what we saw at Grimsvoten, um, where it was quite shallow interaction, although Grimsvoten well, we, didn't, we couldn't do a total grain size or total component distribution for that. Um, that probably would have had more of the dense class. Here at Querfjall, then the, the, judging the total component distribution, we have um, about 30% dense class and another 40% vesicular class, and then various shards and bits and pieces. So there, the two deposits are very distinct in grain size, and they're very distinct in components which is consistent with them having different eruption mechanisms. So we went one step farther um, and did a lot of microprobe work to try to look at the sulfur content of the glass. So we expect that as magma goes to the surface, it's going to lose and degas sulfur. And we have, sorry, this is a fairly complicated plot, but in blue, we have, uh, through the stratigraphy of the tuff cone, the X's are sulfur measured in melt inclusions. Those are little pockets of glass that are trapped in a crystal and assumed to give you a sense of how much sulfur was originally in the magma. So you can see in the magmatic and the phreatomagmatic, we have fairly high sulfur contents and very consistent uh, with other eruptions in Iceland. In the shards, um, and Emma carefully separated out dense shards and vesicular. Uh, there's not much difference. But you can see in the, the hydromagmatic deposits, you have uh, an intermediate amount of sulfur. It seems to actually increase through the sequence. 
Um, and then in the magmatic deposits, uh, you have lower sulfur, so it's totally degassed. So these were clearly quenched at sooner, um, i.e. a higher pressure than the magmatic ones. And um, we also did some work looking at the water content. It's the same story. So these are the hydromagmatic, slightly higher water, higher sulfur than the magmatic. And we can model that. And the, our, our best estimates are that the hydromagmatic eruption uh, was interacting with groundwater at pressures of somewhere between 2 and 6 MPA, so tens of meters below the surface. And the, the sort of fascinating thing to me is that that continued and persisted throughout what was probably a fairly long-lived eruption. So you must have had a continual feed of groundwater into the, the vent or into the conduit. OK. Um, moving on and looking at ash size, our main focus here has really been to try to understand how ash is transported, which means understanding how it falls out of a, a plume. And <clears throat> um, just to recap what we've seen, uh, this is, these are compilations of total grain size distributions. Here are the phreatomagmatic I just showed you. Um, but in silicic eruptions and also mafic eruptions, we get very different uh, size distributions of particles depending a lot, we think, on secondary processes. So for example, in the silicic, these eruptions are ones that had a primary eruption plume, but no corresponding density currents or pyroclastic flows, whereas these somewhat larger eruptions, well, one is Mount St. Helens that had the blast, and the other is the large Campanian eruption, which really was dominated by pyroclastic flows that generate a lot of fine material in what we call coignimbrite plumes. So we think that um, there's a primary component. There's also a secondary component to determining how much fine ash you have. And it's the fine ash that all of the, the ash transport modelers are worried about. Um, so we'd been working this with people at the UK Met Office for three or four years now. And with I, what I find, uh, no matter what sort of research you're doing, you get into something, and then you, you start asking questions that make you step back and simplify and simplify and simplify. And just last spring, Allison and our student Jen Saxby and I um, started saying, OK, but what? how are people measuring size? And we realized that. Volcanologists, for the most part, use sieving. And sieving has, sieves have a square mesh, which if you're just sieving spheres, the mesh is the sphere diameter. Um, however, our particles are not spheres. So we started thinking, well, what size is being measured when you're actually sieving? And these are, are just preliminary data that Jen's trying to refine. But uh, this example shows the spectra. This is the nominal sieve size. And for these particles, which she intentionally took in extreme shape, these are um, ash particles from Katla volcano in Iceland, which has had periodic eruptions that they call silk eruption that produce these, these really um, elongate needles. So it's an extreme shape. But the points are her measurements of long axis length um, relative to the nominal sieve size. So not surprisingly, the needles, because they can go through in their intermediate and small axis, um, are not well measured by the sieve size. And in fact, we discovered that even if you turn them into an equivalent sphere diameter, uh, it looks like about half of the particles in the nominal sieve size, less than 125 microns, are actually larger than that. So this is a problem um, because a lot of the ash modeling just takes grain size distributions reported by volcanologists and models them as equivalent sphere diameters. <coughs> uh, we also have, uh, it, it gets worse 
because typically for the smallest particles, people use some sort of optical measurement, like a master sizer, and that is a, a laser measurement, and it, is, it assumes MIE scattering from spheres. So that it's a different measurement, and it also has its problems. More and more people are using various types of automated imaging, um, like the static Malvern Masticizer, where you spray out your particles and measure the size and shape on what's really a projected area. Um, we just got a, a dy dynamic automated imaging system, the CamSizer, that we're starting to play with, hoping we can actually use it to get terminal velocities. And then, there's an increasing uh, use of tomography, which does give you a full 3D size and shape, but is very resolution dependent. So <coughs> uh, I, I know this is a lot of detail, but, but we realized that, that all these people are making different measurements and assuming different things, and they don't intersect at the same point. So common measurements um, used in ASH modeling are either these 2D measurements from something like the uh, morph mass, uh, sorry, Malvern's morphology. And in 2D, if you're looking in thin section or morphology, then you can measure a long axis. You can measure um, the aspect ratio. You can measure an equivalent circle diameter. And then there's a, a shape factor called the Riley sphericity that is uh, used by some people in ASH modeling that's a ratio of the area to the perimeter. Uh, the equivalent in 3D in tomography, so here you can get three axes, so you can measure uh, both an elongation and a flatness. Um, you can get an equivalent sphere diameter, and then the equivalent sphericity is, again, the volume versus the surface area. So we started wondering about, OK, how do all these different types of measurements actually affect, um, or how are they related to this equivalent sphere diameter that is used in ASH modeling? So clearly, if we know the shape, then we can make relationships between an axis length and an equivalent sphere diameter. And that's pretty simple geometrically for simple geometric shapes. And so we're starting to try to do that for some deposits that we're interested in. This is now a theoretical relationship between long axis length equivalent sphere diameter and expected sieve diameter. Um, Jen, at the moment, is, is trying to um, work on, on analyzing um, tomographic images. She's collected a lot from ASH samples to do this more rigorously. But the real question uh, that I wanted to end with is an issue that John Stevenson raised a few years ago, which is that from a pragmatic point of view, we know that volcanic ash from Eyjafjallajökull Yokel and Grimsvotten reached the UK um, and actually reached Europe, and yet none of the models that are currently out there would predict this. So there's a, a fundamental question, and already you can guess what we think the answer is, because these are the images of ash particles that he collected that reached the UK, and they're clearly not spherical. So um, really quickly, we've been working on thinking about how shape affects fall velocity, but that sent us on that little excursion through how shape affects size. And one thing we've done is um, do some experiments with analog particles and just drop them in different fluids to get it and have different sizes to get at different Reynolds numbers. And so the Reynolds number um, down here, we're in uh, laminar or Stokes flow, and you can see the particles fall quite regularly. But as soon as we get to somewhat higher Reynolds number, you start getting a lot of secondary motions. And you know this from watching leaves fall from trees, right? They start going back and forth. And so that uh, strongly affects their drag coefficient. And this is just a collection of data. The, the red line here is the analytical solution. 
of drag coefficient versus Reynolds number for spheres. Um, these are our particles, and you can see that most of our particles have a uh, that are irregular shape or not spheres have a somewhat higher drag than predicted. And when we get up into this intermediate Reynolds number regime, because of the secondary motions, they have quite a bit different drag. And we can see this more uh, quantitatively. So this is the percentage of error um, on the velocity calculation if you assumed spheres. You can see that the error increases as you increase the Reynolds number, and it also increases as you decrease the sphericity. So here, a perfect sphere is, has a sphericity of one, so more extreme shapes have a lower sphericity. Um, if we put that in a very simple layered atmospheric model and run a number of samples for particles of different sizes, here the red are a sphericity of 0.5, the black are spheres, and see, if the particles are really small, it doesn't matter because they just they stay up in the atmosphere. Uh, but when we get to particles of 100 microns, then shape matters quite a bit. And um, we can see this again. So this was with 100 microns. Here are um, projected particle travel distances from 100 to 500 microns. And so you can see that spheres of 500 microns versus particles with a sphericity of 0.5 for 500 microns. Here they reach the UK, here they don't. And um, so finally, if we come to this question of what John Stevenson called big grains go far, this was his compilation of particle length versus distance for a lot of observed cryptotephra in uh, the UK and particularly Scandinavia. And he noted that if you just looked at particle length, you have a lot of points here that shouldn't, by theory, be able to get there. Um, and so the, the very last slide I'm going to show you is some modeling we've done for the VETA ash. Um, this is a, an ash layer that covers throughout Scandinavia and Europe. It's a marker bed 12,000 some years ago, so it's it's very widespread. It's very beloved of um, cryptotephra folks. And you can see that the, uh, this VETA ash is extremely platy. It's not close to spheres. And just uh, Jen's been playing with the Met Office model name to see if she can get some of those particles to Europe. Um, if she takes the worst case scenario, which is a, a volume a volume equivalent sphere diameter of 190 microns, so that's quite huge. Um, and we have a few particles of those that made it to Norway from the VETA. Then even with really extreme MET conditions, she went through and found, you know, what's the, the strongest plausible winds. She can sort of barely get the largest class there. But if she takes the, the modal diameter, then it's quite common, and she doesn't require the extreme met conditions to get ash to Europe. So we think that, that a lot of the discussion about how are these um, ash particles actually traveling long distances is related to these issues of both size and shape. So I just wanted to thank all my collaborators, um, Alison Russ, Jen Saxby, and Hannah Buckland, who are currently working with us at, at Bristol and then former students, post office, or postdocs and collaborators. So thank you. Right, <laughs> Kathy, you you demonstrate a very uh, sharp contrast between the uh, ash particles uh, during pure magmatic eruption, the fratto magmatic ones, uh, in Iceland. Could you recognize uh, fratto magmatic uh, specimens in the initial phase of 
Mount St. Helen dome collapse or blast? Oh dear, um, that's a really interesting question. This is a long-standing debate. I actually haven't looked for that, um, but in part, the the cryptodome was intensely crystallized. I mean, the it's probably 80% crystalline. So um, um, we don't have a nano sims. I think you'd need a some sort of nano device to uh, look at that. It it would be interesting. I mean, certainly um, there's anecdotal evidence. I heard someone for the during the 20th anniversary of Mount St. Helens, they invited back a lot of eyewitnesses. And there's some very famous pictures that were taken by uh, Keith and Dorsey Stoffel, who were geologists who just rented a small plane to fly them around the volcano. They happened to be up in the air when the eruption started. And what Keith said, um, which he hadn't seen the volcano before, so I've heard people sort of poo-poo this, but he described water as gushing out of the north flank of the mountain right before the, the landslide. Um, and it was a, a, it had glaciers on it, it was a snow-clad volcano, so there was clearly a lot of water around. The extent to which the fragmentation was caused by magma water interaction versus just decompression, my, my hunch is that the decompression was the most important, though obviously you had a lot of water expansion there too, so. <laughs> Uh-oh, I must have put people to sleep. <laughs> yeah, certainly um, there's there's lots of volcanic ash in the ocean, and there's there's um, actually a woman working with Steve Sparks who's been trying to go through all the old ODP records and create a, a Tefra database. Um, we haven't worked on ash deposition in the ocean, but we did have a student who was working on lake cores in, the, in East Africa um, as part of a project where we're trying to understand the history of volcanism better. And we started to have questions about the veracity of the lake core sediments. So she actually went to um, Calbuco volcano, which erupted in, what, 2015? Um, and the, the ash, trajectory was directly over several lakes. So um, she teamed up with someone from Chile and we had uh, thickness and grain size data from next to the lakes that was collected right after the eruption and then the lake cores and they seemed to correlate very well. Now of course the ocean, I guess you have to worry about currents and various things, but certainly in, in shallower lakes, um, they seem to preserve a better record than on land where the ash can blow around later. Uh, when you model the transport of the of the ash, you you have of course to take into account the elevation at which it's, it's injected in the atmosphere, and so presumably you have a relationship between that and the distance. Uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't no? mention that for the Veda ash. That was another variable, and it it the only way I mean, in, as well as extreme winds, it had to have been an eruption column of over 25 kilometers is the only way she can get it there. So yes. Um, although at, at Mount St. Helens, when we were doing that work, it's, it's interesting because the initial blast plume went up to about 30 kilometers, but the um, reanalyzed re wind data for that day shows that there was basically no wind there. And there was very high winds just above the tropopause, so 10 to 12 kilometers. Um, and they were, you know, 100 they were very strong, so that the ash transport was really being dominated by this high-velocity wind layer, which is, is sort of an interesting point because it means that all of the very high ash, you know, had to fall down before it got entrained into that high-velocity layer. Yeah, I, I have a comment, comment, maybe a bit related to that, but it, it's to, that you didn't say anything about the structure that you're showing here, so I don't know. So when you get a very big eruption, you're going to have a, a big umbrella cloud like this, and maybe when you get a smaller eruption, you're going to have a lesser one. So uh, and so the, the transport is going to initially at least be dominated by this thing, 
and bigger the eruption is, the more this is going to be dominant. But you didn't say anything about that. You yeah. spoke as though ash was just a question of yeah. vertical. No, we've, we've been working with the Met Office who just use a, a advection diffusion model. But, but definitely, yes, and that's why um, some of the work I didn't get to, but the, the last student uh, listed there, Hannah Buckland, is um, we're working on the deposit from the eruption that formed Crater Lake in Oregon, the Mazama eruption, which was magnitude seven. And then um, she's also working with Sam Engwell, who did a lot of work on the Campanian, and, uh, which was another very large eruption from Italy. And what Sam sees in the Campanian is she has, you know, centimeter size pumice particles a thousand kilometers from the vent. And so definitely when you have a large eruption, then you have basically a probably a gravity current on the tropopause that's dominating the transport. So that's that's the next step is to try to we want to do a comparison of the Campanian and Mazama, both of which have Fairly, we have fairly good ash coverage for, and try to understand the limitations of the advection diffusion model, and then play with some of these things like the Baines and Sparks models for uh, the more gravity-driven currents. Okay, more questions? Maybe I have one. Uh, a simple one. So when you showed the, the deposit of ashes from Mount St. Helen, it was not at all homogeneous if you move towards the east, but you had the impression like to have a bump somewhere. Uh, what is it due? So that, um, the, that's been the topic of a lot of discussion. And early on when Carrie and Sigurdsson um, noted that and modeled it, they suggested it was because you had ash aggregation. That, so that it was falling out effectively as a larger particle rather than traveling its distance. Um, it, we actually think it's probably more complicated than that. Um, one picture that I didn't show, but one of my favorite pictures from Mount St. Helens is from a, a National Geographic article. And in the, the central part of Washington, there were what are called mammatus clouds. They're really sort of evil-looking clouds, these black, bulbous ones. And um, Adam Durant did some interesting work on that. And one suggestion is that those clouds are density instabilities formed actually by hydrometeors in ash, so water droplets or ice going to water. And so um, another suggestion is that you were actually uh, crossing into, from the tropopause, um, or from the stratosphere into the, the troposphere and melting those um, hydrometeors that were then sort of depositing out en masse. There, there are several other, we looked at this at the Mount Spur eruption, and there, um, there's a secondary maximum like that, but it seems to be controlled actually by the, the primary grain size distribution. So I think there are a lot of explanations, but it's, it has sent a lot of the community off on um, aggregation modeling, which clearly is important in some circumstances. OK, more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.